At 35 years of age, in his role as executive chairman of the largest free zone in the UAE, the Dubai Multi Commodity Center, Ahmed bin Sulayem has played a key part in the expansion of Dubai's commodity sector and has largely contributed towards Dubai's economy. He says there is no faster growing free zone in terms of services than the DMCC. Construction is well underway on the 55,000 square meter community park for the Jumeirah Lake Towers community and the 107,000 square meter business park, which will also house the world's tallest commercial tower, is currently in the design phase. However, he says this is still not his biggest target. Thank you very much for joining us. With a pleasure. Let's start from the beginning. You have been instrumental at driving the DMCC to what it is today. Looking back to 2002, when the Dubai Multi Commodity Centre was first established, it was located in an area that was then the outskirts of Dubai. Tell us about those initial stages and the growing pains or challenges that you faced back then. Well, you know, the, uh, the way it started was there was a few attempts within the region to create a commodities uh, uh, center. And uh, I think their challenges used to be uh, where to start. So they would like to have to bring in the Wall Street, the, the exchanges before the physical market. And we learned from their mistakes when, you know, because this, this, this uh, initiative came afterwards and we learned from their mistakes and we went for the physical business and moved from there onwards. Um, there was a consultant that was working with us and within the second or third meeting we did away with the consultant because they were doing a lot of studies and I have a, I have a very close relationship with uh, His Highness Sheikh Mohammed bin Rashid Maktoum, the Vice President, Prime Minister of UAE, Ruler of Dubai and I know His Highness mentality. When he wants updates, he doesn't want updates on what you found out. Or what, they need to be tangible, it needs to be tangible. That's why from 2002, I think early 2003, we announced that we were ready to register companies. We had to move. And uh, while we're molding, you know, the decree was there while we're molding products and all that, we're also registering, while, uh, registering companies. This is along the lines of putting demarcation in this area, constructing the Almas, going through the design for Almas Tower, gold and silver. Um, some of the challenges that we faced, at, at that time it seemed like a challenge, but we, went, we, took, we took the opportunities within those, within those challenges. We were hands down boycotted by the gold souk. The gold souk, for some reason, the gold Gurdjieff group at that time in that year felt that we were um, some kind of competition. We would, and it's completely different. If you look at DMCC now and look at the gold and jewelry group, there is no comparison. We're too far apart in what we do. Um, we're from production up to retail. We're not, we don't get involved in too much in retail um, and all that. But at the end of the day, that pushed us. Uh, I don't want to waste my time convincing an entity that this is a great concept, join in and all that. We went to the entities that are hungry for it. So where do we go? Regionally and internationally. So every country we visited um, had more or less some challenges and Dubai was a solution. And this is 2002, mind you, before the uh, establishment of RTA, before many projects came to fruition. Um, the other thing is basically we, we visited also other areas to learn what their edge uh, is. So. The, the number one exhibition uh, center in the world is Vegas. So we went to the JCK show for jewelry, we met with people, networked there, went to Hong Kong, visited the Jim Mao Tower, where, which, where they have a diamond exchange that has yet to be approved by the World Federation of Diamond Bourses. And that was approved alongside with Dubai the same year. Um, we visited Belgium, we visited South Africa. I got some, I got some interesting uh, advice from uh, the South African community. It was the Lebanese diamond tier. He was an old man at that time. And he said, if you want to attract business, you just you, don't, you can't go from government to government. You have to talk to the whole community. You have to listen to what the, what the trade needs. And at the end of the day, they make business decisions, whether they branch out or completely move. Um, I'll give you an example. You got both Reliance uh, companies, both Ambani Brothers in DMCC. And that was, I think, some of it maybe due to our marketing. Other, and, and some of it is maybe, I believe, uh, word of mouth. So I, I believe 50-50 you know, is our hard work and develop, delivering the infrastructure and the products, but at the same time, it's word of mouth because there's no faster free zone when it comes to services and, uh, than, than the MCC in Dubai. 
In 11 years, the DMCC's members and communities have contributed between 9 to 12 billion US dollars towards Dubai's GDP. Now the DMCC is the largest free zone in the UAE. Tell us about the success of free zones in boosting the economy for the UAE and more specifically for Dubai. What makes them so attractive to foreign investors? Well, it started off with uh, Javza. Javza is the pioneer in it. And the, uh, the offshoots of, uh, of that, uh, if I would call it that, uh, and the other free zones, was basically uh, some, 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 some more funny stories. They, 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 they remind you of Cirque du Soleil, where you, you see the, the creator of Cirque du Soleil who went and created their own Cirque du Soleil. With Javza, you have people uh, that have moved to other free zones, which I won't name, or come to setting up and taking the network and the community over there. It's very, very um, cutthroat uh, competition. That was happening before DMCC was established. So it was uh, it's good competition because uh, as far as His Highness is concerned, competition breeds quality. I think it's thanks to all the free zones. Javza also were, were very helpful. Mind you, the Dubai Tea Trading Center is in Javza South. We didn't have space for it here. It's, uh, this place is too prime. That place is made for, their, Javza South has industrial areas. Area. Our Kimberley Process Office, the first one is in, in Davza in the Transguard building, the second one is in Almas Tower. Customs, Dubai Customs will be set up here. Um, but things are moving smoothly. But the, the whole environment of competition, I think, I believe, helped DMCC become what it is. And if it wasn't for the success, I think one of His Highness' biggest success stories um, globally is the Emirates Group. Um, the airport and the second airport, the uh, Dubai Ports Authority, which became DP World, these really, there's a strong synergy between DMCC and these two entities because they're almost the lifeline of uh, DMCC. Otherwise, DMCC would look completely different if the shipping and logistics were not as strong as it is in Dubai. Dubai, whether people like it or not, is the uh, Singapore or the Hong Kong of the Arabian world and actually even for India. And, and the Asian areas within this region. So, so it's, and that's not the end of the line. For, for, for me, that's the beginning, that's the new foundation where we need to capitalize on and build on. And um, you will notice that with time coming forward that even the tallest office tower is not the biggest target I'm, I'm going after and doesn't have to be construction. It's just what, filling gaps in the industry and really uh, Dubai industry and internationally. And, you know, the new Silk Route that, we, that people talk about, I'm happy about that. But for me, I'd, rather, I'd like to see a spider web around Dubai and move forward. And, and we'll, we'll see how that works. But that's where we are right now. I think the biggest challenge currently is awareness. And uh, I'm looking to rectif uh, so solve that this year, not next year. This year, the local community will know that DMCC is along the lines of Emirates Group, uh, Godolphin, as far as specialized uh, free zone. Now, the 107,000 square meter business park is going to house the world's tallest commercial tower. Tell us the inspiration behind doing this project and how confident are you with this project? We cannot deny that um, a few years ago, this is something that nobody would think about. But DMCC, um, as stated by Brenson in the, pre in the announcement, DMCC has paid its debt uh, several years back and it's financially sound, it's a revenue-making uh, entity. At the same time, it's, it's, it's a great community here. DMCC today is the largest free zone in Dubai and the fastest growing free zone in Dubai. It's still growing, we still have a lot to bring in. I mean, um, we're in the final stages of uh, registering uh, Glencore, which is, I believe, the largest company in the world, just brought Extrata. It's a big name for us and uh, it covers a lot of businesses that relate to DMCC. Um, coming back to the uh, tallest, uh, world tallest commercial tower, uh, in rea we had the expansion for a while and there's a rule here on Dubai where you, you may have the land and you may have the plans and you, you will have some ample time. But after a while, this will kick in. If you don't use it, you lose it. Someone else will develop in that place because um, in Dubai, we're not very patient. We want to build fast. We want, we want things done quickly. And it's not about constructing really fast or selling off very fast, but capturing businesses uh, at an opportune time. And this is a real opportune time. I'm, I, in my view, 
I'll never get a better chance to, um, to attract multinational entities that can't find five to 10 or 20 floors or offices to their likings. Which, when I say that, you know, open spaces, car park, you know, car parks, and in a free zone, it's not, it's different. You know, people can say, you know, it's challenging in Dubai. Yes, but not in a free zone. It's a different story for free zone companies, especially for DMCC. Uh, DMCC has become a magnet on its own. And as I mentioned, the community itself is attracting a lot of businesses as well. Their counterparties are coming here. Going back to the tower, about the confidence of it being built, we have the expertise. We've sold out on Mass Tower, Tallest Office Tower in the Middle East, uh, in 2000. For within four hours, just to end users, we had an Oracle system, and there was no brokerage. It looked like buying tickets for the cinema. That's how it looked like. Units were just flying out, and they were they, you, they had to be DMCC members, and it got sold out in a matter of hours. The next day, the Gold Tower was sold out as well to to end users. We were only about a little over 400 members. Today, we're we're over 7,330 something mem companies. And I believe by the end of this year, we'll, we'll, we'll get to 8,000, uh, maybe more than 8,000 companies. With the updates with His Highness, basically, we talked about the tower and he, His Highness asked me how, how tall it's, it is. And I, made, uh, I wanted to make sure it's clear that I'm not playing the game of the uh, pole on top of the tower, because I've seen some of them, they're 50 story high. Yeah. Well, you might as well uh, build the... Uh, the Starbucks Tower in Canada, you know, doesn't make sense to me. For me, we're building the building from the inside out. It's about efficiency and attracting businesses. And the science asks, how tall would it be? It's gonna, I said, it's going to beat all the office towers. He said, because he, he knows me. When, when I go, when we go, when he knows the DMC management, he's like, how tall is it going to be? Might be taller than Burj Khalifa. Now, here comes the biggest compliment from His Highness, where he says, do not go higher than Burj Khalifa. I said, fine, but it will still be the tallest office tower in the world, which is fine with me. And when he said, don't go there, I took it as a compliment because he knew beyond the benefit of doubt this is going to happen. Mm -hmm. There was no, and for me, uh, that type of confidence and that type of compliment is not something anyone can get. The DMCC is home to the Dubai Exchange, the Dubai Gold and Commodities Exchange, the Dubai Pearl Exchange, the Tea Trading Centre, as well as the 75,000 people that work and live in JLT. So is there a single factor driving DMCC's growth? According to the Executive Chairman, what makes DMCC so unique is its confidence and consistency. As we continue our conversation with Ahmed bin Sulaym. In your opinion, what is the single factor driving DMCC's growth? The confidence and the consistency. Um, people, I think, I think there was an assumption. You know, I think the papers did, did, did some damages, international papers and all that, with their doom and gloom bashing at the, uh, I think, four years back or so. Um, but the whole world was under uh, a global uh, challenge. And um, I think People did not see DMCC because of my age. I'm 35 now, so I'm talking about five years or so, barely 30. And people did not expect there will be uh, DMCC would DMC would be in a, in a, in a moving fast or anything anything like that. But mind you, we've sold our towers, three towers, and when properties went down, residential and offices, it just made it easier for us to attract more companies. So. Um, 2010, over 700 companies. 2011, double that. 2012, 2000, uh, 2033 companies. And this year, we're going to break that record. So we're moving faster, even though pr property prices are going up. That's a reflection of the demand. But, for, but whatever happened a few years ago, and whatever challenges other developers may face, it does not apply to DMCC. We've proved that time and time again. Um, I believe also that uh, what, what makes the MCC different is that you have consistency from the announcement till today. Yes, we've learned, we've adapted, but we adapt fast. A lot of our decisions, even though it could be two difficult decisions, um, our mindset is as follows. Well, what would the government of Dubai expect? Or what would his, his highness expect in this situation? And then things become much simpler and we move forward. 
Looking to the master planning of the JLT community, construction is well underway on the 55,000 square metre community park, which is set to be completed at the end of this year. You are also developing the Uthman Ibn Affan Mosque, which you recently donated 1 million dirhams towards. How challenging is it to meet the demands of both the businesses that operate out of DMCC and those that call JLT home? It's 75,000 people that work and live in JLT and um, the coming to the park priority for you know it's, it's, uh, people people will look at it and feel that uh, i've been tailor making this whole thing but that's giving me too much credit the Kobe Bryant visit is uh, is an opportunity that we couldn't pass and uh, and um, you know he's visiting dubai and abu dhabi under the presidency of his highness sheikh uh, in hamdan barak al nahyan um, DMCC is heavily involved in that as well. His first visit is the Almas Tower and the park. Uh, if you look behind you, the first thing that's finished is the basketball court. There will be half court also as well there. Um, as far as the greenery, I mean, if you recall, I think it was two months back where I personally with the DMCC management planted some trees over there. Uh, as far as the park is concerned, everything else is more or less uh, if you look at the grass, it will be rolled into the uh, park. Um, amphitheater, the construction of it wouldn't be challenging. So uh, there's no challenge in that. Um, coming to the mosque, uh, the challenge was more or less a chicken and egg situation. Even Awqaf, they don't want to build a mosque in an area where there's no population. And there was, um, on the Arab media side, they were saying, where's your mosque? Where are plans for the mosque? Where is that? And we responded by saying we have four for prayer areas in JLT. And uh, the mosque is a must in, in any case, and we have a spot for it, and this, which is M2, which has been announced recently, and we will update uh, the public on the design. People know what's, how it, what it serves and the name and all that, but it's gonna progress very well. Um, but the challenge is pretty much, you can't please everyone, and at the end of the day, you're gonna have to prioritize things. Um, having the mosque is very important for this community and uh, from our side uh, the timing was great. Now the community park will be replacing some of the lake areas in JLT. There have been mixed reactions towards this from the wider community. How will this community park improve the living conditions in JLT? Lake C is completely uh, converged into a multi-use park with an amphitheater, um, some amenities, and there's a basket, uh, basketball court and a half court. Um, lake A, just a small part of it, if you, look at, uh, if you look at Lake A and what we've highlighted, it's a small part of it and, the cl and one cluster on that end doesn't even have the view of the lake and it's not even, it's not even a lake, it looks more like a mini river. And we're utilizing land and a part of Lake A, but you still have a huge winding uh, lake in Lake A and the other lake we don't have any plans to touch. But what we're building over there is uh, more car parks, uh, some amenities to, uh, to uh, complement uh, the JLT community with different uh, materials. At the same time, there's the mosque within that area. And the other lake towards the end uh, where, 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 where the um, Emirates Golf Course is, we're not even thinking about touching that. So, you know, some, some in the media feel... Uh, but there were mixed reactions with this change. What do you say to was, the residents who invested wanting lakeside views? Well, let's be realistic. People have moved in here, what, 2006? People have moved in and out maybe four times over. Who are these community, community people? I've, I've responded to them. I think it was Iranian business that came up with that story. J, JLT boss says, I hate lakes. They, should have continued, I like efficiency more. That's my quote. But you know, you cut the statement in half, it's not out of context, it's not a statement anymore. Um, in any case, I responded to all the uh, criticism, I invited them all. But turns out that 90% of them don't live in JLT, the, the people who are criticizing. And the few of them that did were very happy with the answers and the correspondence um, about the, uh, about the uh, premium for, for view. The ones that I spoke to don't, are not even around that area. Others were thanking us for the park because they had to go out of JLT and they didn't want to go through traffic. In fact, having more amenities here
keeps people here away from getting stuck into traffic or creating traffic themselves. So if anything, this is a big plus for the community. And it's not an idea that we thought about uh, out, uh, on the whim. We've been talking to developers, we've been talking to, and this is, this is the part that, you know, whether it's uh, lazy journalism or not enough space, I've heard all the excuses, so I don't know what to think of it. Now, coming back to the park and what people may say, you can't make everyone happy, but I'm telling you, the basketball court, people are fighting over it, and the other amenities, I guarantee you, they'll be fighting over that as well. Um, and the mosque, I've heard comments where people said, now I'll move to JLT. Now I'm happy to set up my office over there, because it feels awkward to them to sit in a big, you know, in a, in a mini city within Dubai, where there's no mosque, it just sends the wrong message. And um, we're just taking it forward. The, the mosque is on M2, it's not on Lake A anymore. We highlighted the area, like I said, we would compromise or we would utilize, if better word, in a better word, we would utilize part of Lake A, uh, Lake A, which is a small part of it, and part of the land around it. We did, M2 is now where the mosque is going to be, and you know, it's, construction will start very fast, and I'm very bullish about it so much that I put one million dirhams of my own saving as the first donor of it. And I'm meeting other donors who want to talk about also pitching in in the mosque. And in the Arab culture and the Muslim culture, it's a big deal to, be, to have that. It's, it's part of your bucket list. I don't want to wait till I'm 60. I, don't, I can't guarantee that I'll reach 60 either. I'd rather tick that off at this age now. You know, it's a similar to my personal donation that I gave to the UA Red Crescent. Uh, last year of 1 million dirhams as well. Now in June you received the Crow Horworth Award for Government Personality of the Year for your role in the expansion of the global commodity sector and your overall contribution towards the economy of Dubai, just to name a few. What does this accolade mean to you and how does this further motivate you? What's next for you? Uh, my early years, I, I always feared those awards because I always feel that well, hearing it from people, you know, they feel that that's a target or that's something. For me, I utilize it, you know, you know I, receive, I receive the UN creden uh, credential to represent Sibjo for Western Asia as well. Um, I always fear that it would get into my head and thank God it doesn't. Every time I come to Al Mas Tower, it's almost no different from day one of joining Al Mas Tower. So I like, I like that pressure. And what does that mean, Government Personality of the Year? I mean, we received, I believe I received in 2010, or 2009, the Middle East Investor uh, Award of the Year. And uh, these awards to me, it, said, it has my name, it says DMCC, but in reality, these awards are His Highness Sheikh Mohammed bin Rashid Al Maktoum, the Vice President, Prime Minister of UAE, Ruler of Dubai, and the founder of Dubai Multi Commodity Center. He's been, His Highness has been guiding us, pushing us, and uh, if it wasn't for his clear vision, this wouldn't have happened. They used to call me in the early days the lawnmower. Pretty much, you give me the blueprint, I'll go with it, and I'll go and won't stop. And you know, maybe later on I look back and think, what the hell happened? You know, what was that? that that's scary. And maybe at this age, if you bring in the MCC concept, and I had this experience, I've delivered these projects or part of this success, I might be afraid to touch it because 2002 is not what it looks like in 2013. The challenges were much higher. Um, Emirates Airlines did not land in all the continents. The Scandinavian area was just less than a year back. Um, so things were different and the market was smaller. To say, for me to tell you that I saw this happening, we pushed for it, I'd be lying. We just took it day by day, step by step. And um, the instructions and guidance, as I said, came from His Highness. And it's pretty much, His Highness says, or asks us to jump and we just ask how high and we move forward. So um, this is where we're, we're at at this stage. Well, thank you very much for your time today, Executive Chairman of the DMCC, Ahmed bin Sulayem. Thank you. More than a pleasure. Thank you.